Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, welcome to the ACAM panel on sexual violence in Asian communities in Canada. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and invite all in attendance to remain mindful of our presence on the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territories of the Musqueam First Nation people. A brief note that the panel today will be video, video recorded for documentation purposes. So if you don't want to be filmed or photographed, please let our videographer know in the back. My name is Stephanie Fung, and I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Asian Canadian and Asian Migration Studies Program, which is a new undergrad program at UBC that provides a minor to students who are interested in the histories and cultures of Asian Canadian communities. Today, we invite panelists Dr. Nora Angelis, Dr. J.P. Katungal, and Kei Ho to explore the nuances of sexual violence in Asian communities in Canada. After their speeches, Dr. C.J. Rowe will briefly discuss support services available at UBC. This will be followed by questions from the audience. So I just want to let you know that we'll be taking both oral and written questions. And Sue, who will be, she's at the back right now, she'll be giving out cue cards to all of you. And for those of you who want to write down your questions during the panel, feel free to do so and we'll collect them later and read them aloud. Now I want to give a general content note. Our panelists will be reflecting on the topic of sexual violence, which I recognize and acknowledge may be unsettling for many of you in various ways. So a gentle reminder to remember to take care of yourselves in this space. Please feel free to stand up, move around, or leave the room whenever you want during the event. And also there are two active listeners in this room. If they could raise their hands to let you know where they are. So there's Maris and Jane right there. They'll be available during and after the event if anyone wants to check in with them. So without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce our four speakers. Our first panelist is Dr. Leonora Angelis, who is Associate Professor at the School of Community and Regional Planning and the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality and Social Justice at UBC. She is currently the Graduate Program Advisor at SCARP. She is also Faculty Research Associate at the UBC Center for Human Settlements and the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Unfortunately, she's not able to stay for the whole event as she has a doctoral exam to attend at 12.30, so we're extremely grateful that she has agreed to come here and talk today, despite her tight schedule. Next up, we have Dr. J.P. Katungal, who is an instructor in critical race and ethnic studies in the GRSJ Institute. His teaching interests include anti-racist feminisms, queer of color critique, the politics of knowledge production, and migration and diaspora studies. JP's research develops queer of color and anti-racist feminist interventions in the scholarship of teaching and learning. He is also engaged in ongoing work on racial geographies of sexual health, alignments between homonationalism and straight allyship, and queer of color theorizing in Philippines Canadian studies. Our third panelist, Kei Ho, is a queer, non-binary Chinese settler ra raised in unceded Coast Salish territories. They put energy into QTI POC communities, representations, and activisms. Currently, they're facilitating a student-directed seminar titled Voices from the Margins, Critical Perspectives on Race, Sexuality, and Settler Colon Colonialism, focusing on women of color and indigenous feminisms, queer of color critiques, and community and art-based resistant movements. Kay is an editor for The Talon and a portrait photographer whose work is framed in community representation and radical visibility. Last but not least, Dr. C.J. Rowe is a diversity advisor, sexual assault intervention and prevention in student development and services at UBC, and received a PhD in cross-faculty inquiry in education in 2014. C.J.'s work as a diversity advisor uses a feminist intersectional approach to provide leadership in the development and implementation of the university's sexual assault intervention and prevention education plan. CJ's research interests include queer theory, post-feminism, embodied pedagogy, performance studies, and women's music. So without further ado, please do join me now in welcoming Dr. Angelis. Thank you very much to um, the organizers of this um, symposium, particularly to uh, Professor Chris Lee and to Stephanie. Um, in particular for acknowledging the indigenous lands on which we are staying, as well as the potential trigger warning that um, some of the things we'll be saying 
today would elicit um, in our audience. So I want to tell you first the outline of what I'm going to present. I'd like to tell a little bit of a story of how I came to become aware and to get involved in issues on sexual violence, um, how we can look at it from intersectional and decolonizing perspectives, and also provide some analytical framework as the first speaker on this panel that will be exploring the what I call the PRE analysis or the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors for us to explain the issue of sexual violence within Asian uh, communities in Canada, what's already being done to address this issue, and what more can we do. So I hope you uh, keep this outline in mind as I go along. When I was a graduate student at Queen's University, one of the first non-academic jobs that I got involved in was a project called Wife Assault, Domestic Violence, a project by then, now I think it's now defunct, OCVIM, or Ontario Coalition of Visible Minority Women. And the main objective of this project was to raise awareness among the police, the court judges, and social service providers on how they could um, improve their services to their constituents and to the general public, keeping in mind that there is a certain Orientalist view that, oh, it's in the culture of this Middle Eastern, um, African, Asian communities in Canada. It's how um, they uh, demonstrate uh, their family dynamics. And at the time, one of the first things that really stand in mind is how much, despite the McLean's Magazine issue in 1980s, that led to the Canadian federal government's providing resources to immigrant settlement services and frontline service providers that our immigrant and refugee communities are still far behind when it comes to being served by um, our uh, frontline service providers, including the police, in addressing violence issues broadly defined. And at the time, I got to meet uh, Juliet Cuenco, who was an anti-violence advocate and a really strong um, Canadian, uh, Filipino-Canadian community in Ontario at the time who sadly um, died a tragic death at the hands of her husband. Um, Juliet uh, is very much like many of us in this room, graduated from a top um, university in the Philippines and, and sadly um, did not live to see the fruits of the work that she's doing in the area of violence. And by the time when I came back um, and traveled across uh, the country, Saskatchewan, and now here in British Columbia, I realized that there are so many other um, news that deal with sexual violence, honor killing, uh, and other tragic events within the Asian community in Canada. And I don't want, and I want to say at the onset, that I, I wish that we keep in mind the diversity within the Asian community. And that while there is a tendency for us to paint a homogeneous picture of this issue of sexual violence and violence broadly defined, that there are still internal differences within the community given many different patterns of immigration, socio-historical uh, uh, norms and, and practices within this community. And I just want to uh, uh, perhaps highlight some of the um, uh, news story that came to my mind as I was preparing for this talk. Uh, the Chahal um, um, tragic um, massacre of um, uh, eight members of the family in Vernon uh, related to his strange wife, uh, Rajwar. Uh, Mohammed Shafia families, the so-called now Kingston Canal um, uh, murder that led to um, uh, the death of three sisters and their aunt. And uh, Jassy Sidhu, you probably remember this campaign, uh, supposedly an honor killing um, that was uh, orchestrated by her own mother and an uncle. Now, what's violence? And perhaps this is what I want us to 
get as a takeaway point here that when we talk about sexual violence, it is really just part of a broader spectrum of violence that we see happening in our society, not just within the Asian community, but also in the larger Canadian society and globally as well. There's material, structural, symbolic, and virtual violence. And I note here the increased importance of and growth of cyber violence and, and bullying that happens in social media uh, and in virtual spaces. So the use of physical force against people we call as physical violence, and we're probably familiar with that, but let's not uh, forget that who the main um, uh, survivors are of this violence uh, and, and, and victims in real life. Girls, uh, women, gender non-conforming trans people, uh, including men who encounter this entire spectrum for the more psychological to different forms of homophobia and microaggression. So I want us to keep in mind that violence is really a colonizing construct. Whether we're talking about the um, uh, penetration of an unwillful, non-consenting body to the colonizing effects of cotidian microaggression that are meant to humiliate, degrade, and oppress um, other subjects, which is essentially the objective of colonial projects. I want us to keep in mind that we need to find um, an intersectional lens and language to discuss that whenever we talk about sexual violence and domestic violence, we're really looking at different positionings, locations, sites, uh, sites, as well as identities and uh, access of difference and material deprivation that affect the context in which violence occur. And so going now to my PRE analysis to go first into the predisposing factors of domestic and sexual violence that I see happening within uh, Asian communities um, in, uh, in Canada. And I want to go th through this uh, very quickly uh, because of, uh, lack of lack of time. First of all, uh, again, drawing from social anthropological studies, we know that the practice of patrilocality, uh, whenever um, children and, and women uh, uh, and partners join husbands and male-dominated figure, there's more likely for um, domestic violence to occur. In societies, for example, where there's weak bilateral kinship ties, uh, there's more, it creates greater propensity for, for domestic violence and other forms of sexual violence. Um, we also see how idealized gendered age difference at marriage and all other um, factors that affect idealized marriage relationships. The domestication of women and feminized bodies, poverty, discrimination, homelessness, illiteracy, Prostitution as an institution and as an industry also create predisposing factors. And I would say histories in Asia that include histories of political, social, forced prostitution and human trafficking. In particular, um, if, I'd uh, if, if, if I could remind you of the history of the so-called comfort women of forced militarized prostitution, sexual slavery during the Second World War. I want now to go into the reinforcing factors. And by reinforcing, I mean those factors that tend to exacerbate, reinforce this uh, predisposing factors that I just talked about. There's uh, sexism, cisgenderism, and heteronormativity that compels people, particularly non-gender conforming people, to see um, heterosexual, heteronormative relationship as the norm, uh, which of course set the, the, the tone and the stage for violence uh, be, because uh, against uh, trans and gender non-conforming people because of homophobic 
and transphobic um, views and, and ideas. And this leads, of course, to how within our own communities, as in other communities, we also see a lot of gender role reinforcement and stereotyping. But what enables this? You, you, we have these reinforcing factors, but what enables this at a concrete level? So I want to talk now about the enabling factors. I would say that I think part of the root of the violence that we see in the more sexualized forms, including domestic violence, which is of course part of the continuing continuum that I'm talking about, is a largely sex phobic culture. And I'm not a well-trained sociologist to really explain this in more in-depth level, but I'm really fascinated by this rather paradoxical mix in our society today of hypersexualization, sexual frustration, puritanism, and sexualized violence. So how do you square that circle? How do you really ex explain that? And I think part of the answer has to be read within the commodi current commodification of feminized and sexualized bodies, including male bodies, in profit-driven popular media sex industry. We have normalized rape culture in social, public, and intimate spaces. Uh, the so-called China doll, mates, maids, and horse con conflation that we see within um, uh, immigrant communities, particularly Asian communities. The continuities in gendered Asian migration patterns uh, within Asia and from Asia to Canada. And also the prostitution link to mili the military industrial complex that has exacerbated the exotification and eroticization of Asian women and other feminized subjects. So I am flashing here some books that have talked about the prostitution in the US United States led military industrial complex in Asia, and I don't have the time to discuss in great detail the contents of these books, but you just have to look at the back pages of a mainstream Vancouver newspaper, Georgia Strait, where you see um, massage parlors with um, um, uh, spas and other what had been identified as potential fronts for prostitution uh, in, uh, in, our, in our city. Uh, and I like this in particular, confessions of one who is a uh, habitue of an Asian massage parlor saying, I like going to them. The interesting thing is the girls. When you are banging them, they are into it. But when you finish, it's as though a switch flips and they are all business again. White girls aren't like that. So there is, you can see how the, the Orientalism happening this as well. So what's being done to address these issues? I won't go into great details on this because of lack of time. We have a lot of organizing happening within our communities from Take Back the Night Marches to the formation of Asian Canadian Women's Centers and Transition Shelters. There's a lot of intersectional campaigns. In particular, I want to uh, highlight our City of Colors campaign that had been uh, raising awareness of gender nonconforming identities within uh, Asian and, and other um, immigrant communities. But what more can be done? I'd like to see increased solidarity and cross-cultural movements and communication between indigenous and Asian anti-violence movements. And I'm saying this because I'd like us to examine and address what I consider to be an intra-Asian Orientalism. And I know it's difficult for me to discuss this in a very uh, short minute, and, and it's probably something that we haven't really come to terms with. I call this the internal racist ethno-nationalist pride existing within Asian commu uh, Canadian community that accepts and excuses violence against some Asian and other ethnocultural groups, including indigenous groups, but not their own. I'd like to see more intersectional campaigns like the City Colors involving Asian Canadian community and discussing the responses of, our, of members of our own community to these campaigns. I'd like to see more organizing against sexual and other forms of violence within our community and to mainstream campaigns against domestic and sexual violence within our own immigrant settlement services agencies, many of whom cater to Asian communities in Canada. And I thank you for your um, 
patience in listening. I'm sorry for leaving early. You can email me at my address, nora.angelis at ubc.ca. Thank you very much and my sincere apologies. Thank you so much, Dr. Angelis, for coming. Before you go, I'd like to give a, a gift to you. Do we still need a computer? Do you, still, do you want to sit there? I can sit, sit there. Sure, yeah, that's fine. I can. There we go. Uh, I'd like to begin by, um, actually, no, I'm going to sit up. I'm going to stand up there. Thank you very much to Chris and Stephanie for inviting me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Maraming salamat. Magandang tanghali po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is JP Katungo, and uh, I'm a faculty member in the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Stephanie for doing the land acknowledgement, but I want to go further into what that means, that we are doing this work in the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied territories of the halkomanum speaking Musqueam First Nations. This, I think, to me, is a call to ethical responsibility. It is a reminder uh, of the need for us to constantly think about our positionalities in this land and the responsibilities that that entails. Uh, and that is not just a checkbox that we need to do at the beginning of, of events. Uh, this is, after all, not unrelated to the topic of today. Um, Indigenous uh, scholars and activists have said time and again that sexual and gender-based violence are tools and practices of settler colonialism. Um, and colonial genocide, our very own uh, Sarah Hunt here at UBC has argued as much, uh, and so has others. Um, some examples that we might give include uh, the legal imposition of gender binary um, norms and um, patriarchy through the Indian Act, uh, rape, uh, and other forms of sexual assault in Indian residential school systems, as well as um, the contemporary issue, uh, very important, of missing and murdered indigenous women. So those of us who are here as visitors uh, or trespassers um, or settlers are here partly because of these practices. Uh, and so far as they uh, kind of paved the way, as it were, for the systemic dispossession, uh, displacement, and indeed erasure um, that is uh, central to the project of settler colonialism. And when I was first invited to uh, be part of this conversation, I really wasn't sure what to say. Um, I suppose except for one thing, uh, that this is not going to be about how irredeemably patriarchal and the sexually and um, engenderedly violent Asians are. Um, if you came wanting to hear about that, um, then uh, this is not that kind of talk. Um, this discourse of um, culturalized violence, I think, is very dangerous. And I think I want to explore a bit more Nora's um, points earlier about discourses of honor killings. Um, honor killings discourses, the idea that they are, that these kinds of violence are specific to and rooted in uh, culture. Um, it naturalizes the idea of people of color, certain people of color, as violent against women. Um, this is a modernist, racialized discourse. Um, it suggests that the West, that white people, uh, have evolved past this um, kind of barbaric cultural practice. Uh, and I use that term because it is the term that is used in the law, right? Uh, the law that was passed in June 16, 2015, called the Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act, um, Bill S-7, um, that targets particular communities for their uh, supposed irredeemably patriarchal and violent culture. Um, it suggests that uh, there needs to be very specific legal and border controls, and this is a form of border control insofar as it emplaces kind of migration 
um, regulations um, through um, the discourse of sexual and gender violence. So I want to go beyond that, right? I, I really want to go beyond the idea that um, there are cultural there's something rooted in culture that makes certain people, certain Asians, uh, and other certain bodies um, susceptible to being violent against um, women in particular. Um, I really want to use Lisa Lowe's idea of uh, the intimacies of four continents uh, here to get us grounded in terms of thinking about the question of uh, sexual and gender violence. Um, in Asian communities. Um, Lisa Lowe's idea of the intimacies of four continents uh, examines the relationships, the legal, imperial, migratory, commercial uh, traffics through which Asia, Europe, Africa, and the Americas were co-created in the 18th and 19th centuries. And here, the intimacy suggests kind of an entanglement and co-production of these spaces. Um, and these are important insights because, um, one, they force us to reckon with the fact that geographical regions are social constructions um, of both sameness, so lumping together Asia, and difference, the splitting of different regions uh, from each other. Uh, Lisa Lowe renders problematic via the idea uh, of intimacies of four continents, um, renders this kind of geographical region idea problematic. Uh, we cannot understand continents, she argues, without paying attention to their entanglements. What does this have to do with the topic uh, for today? Um, I think uh, we need to keep in mind three lessons. Uh, first, uh, as Nora already said, Asia as a category is very messy and should not be understood as, as discrete and internally consistent, but as globally embedded and internally differentiated. Um, this, I think, um, encourages us to think about how, for example, uh, in terms of the global embeddedness of Asia, how imperial relations within Asia and with European and North American um, powers has affected uh, sexual and gender-based uh, norms and the violences that accrue from that. Uh, we can use the example of, Nora already mentioned this as well, wartime violence um, committed in World War II by Japanese forces in Korea and the Philippines, uh, the, com the comfort women um, kind of issue that continues to uh, be a hotbed topic um, in organizing both uh, in diaspora communities and in both Korea and the Philippines. We can also give the example of uh, US military bases in the Philippines and how they are sites of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, I want to invoke the name of Jennifer Laude, uh, a trans woman who was killed um, in 2014 by a, by a US Marine um, who was in the Philippines for a joint military exercise. Um, and uh, Jennifer was killed uh, when the US Marine found out um, that Jennifer was trans. So um, this kind of cis-heteronormative um, idea imposed on particular bodies uh, is part of the very making of this violence. We might think also about British imposed laws in Asian countries um, and how they uh, impose cis-heteronormativity um, in countries like Malaysia and Singapore and India and how this naturalization of cis-heteropatriarchy and the uh, attendant creation of the categories man and woman and their apparent natural um, kind of belonging to each other, more like women to men, um, these helped shape some of the legal contexts, the legal um, factors um, that uh, are important when we are talking about gender-based uh, and sexual violence. These include laws around marriage, um, laws about sexual and gender identity. Many of um, these countries still have these British imposed laws illegalizing homosexuality, for example. Um, and in the case of the Philippines, uh, I know I said British, but Spanish uh, and American-based um, laws uh, still render um, divorce law in the Philippines not a possibility. 
right? Philippines remains the one country in the world that does not allow divorce. It's out Christianing even the colonizers in that sense, right? So that's the second point. And a third and final point I want to uh, draw from Lisa Lowe's intimacies um, of um, four continents, I think is that we need to, um, sorry, the second, not the third, uh, is that we need to attend to the movements uh, and migrations of people uh, and how these relate uh, to the very question of sexual and gendered violence. Uh, I want to argue, as have um, other scholars, that uh, along with uh, settler colonial dispossession, the desire for Asian bodies and other bodies of color organizes Canadian political economy. Um, this is certainly true in terms of labor. If we think historically um, through um, the need for Asian bodies in railroad building, in the salmon canneries, in the lumber industry, and today if we think about um, caregiving as a very much um, Asianized uh, social reproductive industry. What does this have to do with sexual and gender violence? Uh, we need, I think, to look partly at historical examples. In the 1910s, uh, intimacies between Asian men who were at that time socially organized into so-called bachelor societies and white women were legally and publicly understood as sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, through discourses such as white slavery, prostitution, etc. Um, in fact, uh, shifts in immigration policy that ended up finally allowing Asian families to come uh, to Canada to join them, they were hinged on um, anxieties around miscegenation, racial mixing, right? That um, we need to keep, we need to allow Asian families to come together because otherwise they might mix with white women and create mixed race babies. So this is about white purity in some ways, a kind of in, uh, in exclusion via inclusion. So that's one example. And uh, two examples, both cases render Asian masculinity and sexuality a threat to white purity and really to white femininity. Um, via, via this um, proto-feminist discourse of needing to protect uh, women. This came up again in World War II when uh, war propaganda imagery in the Canadian context portrayed Japanese masculinity through discourses of monstrous sexualities. Uh, and we know what happened then in terms of um, in, uh, internment. Um, and yeah, so once again, in the name of white purity, um, the imagery of the fragile kind of white woman gets collapsed uh, with the Canadian nation both threatened by an apparent monstrous uh, Japanese masculinity and sexuality. And the third and final lesson, I'm probably out of time. No, two, minutes. Uh, two minutes, okay, that's not too bad. Um, the last uh, lesson that I, I, I wanna draw is that we need to pay attention to the social organization of sexual and gender-based violence, especially in terms of um, looking into transnational relations. And that's related to migration, of course. And I want to name particularly um, the live-in caregiver program as a necessary um, kind of nation-building policy. Um, and it is one that requires bodies, right? Particular types of bodies, feminized and gendered. Um, activists uh, in the Filipino-Canadian community have been successful in lobbying for the removal of that live-in requirement which is great, but part of the um, argument against that live-in requirement is the fact that domestic spaces uh, are not spaces where you can enforce law, not easily anyway, and that um, rendered uh, live-in caregivers, 95% um, or so of more Filipino women, um, particularly susceptible uh, to certain types of abuse, certainly in terms of their labor, their on-call 24 hours, Right, there's that. But also in terms of sexual and gender-based violence, um, such that uh, the work that is understood to be part of caregiving, um, in many cases, documented cases, also included demands for massages um, and things like that, right? So uh, that's one thing in terms of the ways that migratory and labor policies um, render transnational certain bodies 
and that has effects on gender and sexual violence. And the second thing has to do with um, industry, uh, multinational corporations um, going into other countries. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly of mining uh, in the ways that mining companies, especially Canadian ones, um, literally like take over um, particular spaces um, because of their resources. Uh, and, um, and certain human rights organizations have argued um, and documented uh, instances of um, sexual violence against indigenous communities by security forces um, that were hired uh, by these mining companies. So that is another way um, that um, we need to think about gender and sexual violence uh, Asian communities. So I'm going to end there because I know I've taken up a lot of time, but uh, thank you very much uh, for having me uh, and, and for listening. everybody. Um, my name is Kay and uh, first of all I wanted to thank you all for showing up and for arriving. Um, thank you to Stephanie and Chris and all the volunteers for putting this event together. Um, thank you to my co-panelists, co Lenora who's not here, JP and CJ for sharing your wisdom and insights um, and I'm excited to see what will happen in the discussion afterwards. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded, occupied, traditional and ancestral territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, and I echo JP's call that this is a call to action. And I also echo what Nora Angeli said about hoping to see more indigenous Asian Canadian solidarity networks in anti-violence. Um, and also thinking about sovereignty over sexual and gender politics. Um, and I'm hoping that that will also come out in our discussion afterwards. This topic, sexual violence in Asian communities in Canada, is a conversation I hold dearly, but it is also a conversation that I am afraid of holding. I am afraid because the forces that shape this conversation are big. Big like beyond myself and beyond my body big, like arising out of narratives that exist around and before me big, like violence that stretches across time and oceans and pain big. I cannot talk about this topic without addressing that which shapes the context of this very panel, the ongoing legacy of settler colonialism and gendered and sexual violence that has been imposed on and continually resisted by the indigenous nations of these unceded territories. The processes of diaspora and migration, often under traumatic conditions, that have led us to be here in this room as Asian Canadians, for folks who identify under that. Um, the system of white supremacy that inflicts violence, both material and representational, on our sexualities, bodies, and identities. And the place of enduring silence in which everything collides. How to talk about all of this in 10 minutes? Um, I'm going to take a deep breath here and close my eyes and, because I need it, and I'm going to invite you all to do the same with me. I'd like to share that I'm coming into this conversation as a queer non-binary second generation Chinese settler who has experienced trauma and abuse along racial, gendered, familial, and sexual lines, and who feels disconnected from my culture, ancestry, homeland, and language, and who often dissociates from the room in order to cope. As such, I am struggling with feeling like I'm not good enough that I have nothing to offer this conversation today. And I share that because I think, and I'm learning to hold this as truth, that that speaks more to the narratives that surround and police and belittle people's experiences of trauma rather than the invalidity of my experience. And so in trying to be gentle with my own trigger that I'm carrying in this room in my body today, um, I've chosen to offer only what I can. And a part of me wishes I could offer more but I'm also he just here. I also want to acknowledge that my experience is only my own, and folks in this room have undergone violence that I could never know. And so I also want to honor that coming here is an act of agency and survival 
And I also honor the choices you make around taking care of yourselves and each other. And also to point out that we have two very wonderful active listeners in the room. The topic of sexual violence in Asian Canadian communities is at once expansive and precise. It is about systems of power and it is about individual experience. We cannot talk about sexual violence without addressing the culture of isolation that silences individuals and survivors. In other words, we need to make explicit the link between silence and sexual violence. What I'd like to do today is three things. First, contextualize that silence, which JP and Lenora have also been doing. Two, talk about what it shapes for Asian Canadian individuals and communities. And then do my best to speak into that silence by offering an individual perspective. I offer this as a challenge to begin these conversations with each other and in our homes and families, both blood chosen and otherwise. So what is this silence? By silence, I mean that which silent, I mean that which surrounds and suppresses how or even if we talk about sexual violence in Asian communities, the silence that surrounds our histories of love and trauma of our parents and ancestors, which in turn affect how we come to know intimacy and boundaries and abuse and loneliness and love, which in turn affect how we are or are not in relationship with each other, how we are supported or not supported in our communities. The silence that surrounds what whiteness and white supremacy does to us, how it is inflicted in the form of exotification, fetishization, yellow fever, orientalism, all sorts of hyper or desexualizations, which I could go on and on and on about, and how in turn we inflict that upon ourselves by way of internalized racism, self-hatred, class ascension, and buying into the model minority myth, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, the privileging of light skin, assimilation, self-conceived undesirability. Again, I could go on and on and on. These silences affect how we understand ourselves as bodies and identities as sexual or non or asexual beings and our ways of relating to each other as Asian Canadians. So I'd like to shift gears here because I've said a lot of words and terms that might be hanging in the air without meaning much. Um, and so to try to speak a little bit about this silence that I've been trying to contextualize and as a means to shift away from academia and give this talk a little bit more emotional texture, um, I'd like to share a story. So this is a short story that I wrote in the early spring of 2013, so about three years ago. Um, some of you actually in the audience have heard it before. Um, and at that time, I was spending quite a bit of energy reflecting on the beast that is high school here um, and all the peculiar, unnamed, and silencing dynamics that play out in its hallways. So this story is titled, Hot White Girls and Lunch Table Politics. Um, and I'll be touching on themes of internalized racism, internalized homophobia, um, eating disorders, and self-harm. So again, I honor the choices you make um, to take care of yourselves and each other. Also that you're welcome to laugh. There are supposed to be funny parts of the story. <laughs> okay, Hot White Girls and Lunch Table Politics. Names have been changed. The Canterbury Hall grade eight soccer team was the breeding ground for all the hot white girls, except Lindsay Reiner, poor Lindsay Reiner who got cut on her 13th birthday. I was one of two Asians on the team, me and Kimberly Tung and Abby Thomas too, she was half Asian. We were the three misfits, misfits who didn't know we were misfits, who didn't know why. But there we were, all yellow-skinned and dark-haired, three girls of color trying to stay afloat in a pale sea of skinny bodies. We had the best time together. Abby had a funny nasal voice and called her parents by their first names. Kimberly was a flirt and I was the consummate neutral, the quiet one. Sometimes Kendra Timmons Kruger joined us. She was white, but she had a big butt and big boobs and had sex with lots of boys. They called her a slut. So sometimes she joined us, misfits, unaware of our misfittingness. My friends in grade nine comprised the closest group I've ever had. It was the preteen phone call, talk about nothing all day, MSN messenger kind of friendship. Jasmine was loyal, Pak Ting was kind, Ruby was clingy. We all had single syllable, 
We all had single syllable last names like Tung and Yi and Fong and were whitewashed enough to be considered the cool Asian group. We never talked about it, never talked about skin lightening cream or vomiting in the third stall on the second floor, compulsive self-harm, but it was all there lying on the lunch table and contours of shame next to lip gloss and breakfast tasting like bile. So sometimes I'd escape to the hot white girl lunch table where I had an in because I was teammates with them and was pretty for an Asian girl. I never thought about whether my abandonment hurt my regular friends. I never thought that they might carry the same choke of shame in their mouths. By grade 10, I was the only one still on the soccer team. Somehow I had found a place among all the leggy white girls. I became close to Natalie Williams, one of the most popular ones, all skin and bone and long blonde hair. I would always say something funny on MSN to make her laugh or call her about homework to hear her voice. But I always gripped the phone too hard, said love you first, and never felt right when she hung up. I used to stare at the back of her head in assembly and fantasize about her coming on to me. I never even let myself think about coming on to her. I hated it when she would take out her Blackberry smartphone, because that was all the rage back then. <laughs> um, or razors, okay. <laughs> I hated it when she would take out her Blackberry smartphone because I didn't have hot boys or any boys texting me and she always had boys like Max Walker, or Stephen Mockingbird or Dexter Bailey beeping away at her. I would have done anything for Nat Williams and soon my lunch table friends noticed. Noticed when I ran down the hallway looking for angular shoulders and a blonde ponytail. Noticed when I dropped her name in conversation just to feel pride and deep longing welling inside. Notice how I spent more and more time at the hot white girl lunch table. Eventually my friends called me out on it, on MSN, no less. And I cried and cried and writhed in mucus and knew it was all true, that I was selfish, a social climber, that I was gay and hated my race. Naturally, I made new friends in grade 11. Imagine if you take all the people of color from each social group and tokenize the shit out of them. That's what we were. A mosaic. We reached second place cool status. Not cool enough to have a permanent seat at the hot white girl lunch table, but cool enough to get a temporary rotating seat and sometimes an invite to parties with boys like Max Walker and Stephen Mockingbird and Dexter fucking Bailey. <laughs> I was still close to Nat Williams. Our friendship had progressed to us driving to soccer games together every Wednesday, her singing along to Kelly Clarkson on the stereo and me wishing I knew the words better. She still didn't notice that my head always turned when she walked by, and I always held her a little longer than she did when we hugged. But I never would have told her, because I never wanted to feel how it felt to have mucus on my keyboard and tears on my face and know that it was all true that I was gay and hated my race, that I was queer, yellow, and hollow, pretending to be straight, white, and human. I share this story knowing that it is not everyone's experience, um, but it is my small attempt to connect a lived experience of an isolated youth of color to larger systems of power and narrative and to try to make sense of how these silences affect my relationship with sexual violence today. I also offer this story because in writing it and even just arriving to the page has helped me in my own healing process. Being able to name whiteness and heteronormativity and cisnormativity and erasure in my high school years has helped me make sense of myself in terms of my race, gender, sexuality, and my reclaiming process of that. And also to help me understand how and why I carry trauma the way I do. It's not everything, but it is a starting point. Before I end, I just want to thank people who have been holding me up in this particularly difficult week, particularly in preparing for this uh, panel. Um, so thank you to Jane, to Mel, to Steffi, to Erica, May, Yolanda, Christy, and all the folks in the student-directed seminar that I'm very grateful to be sharing space with.
um, because they've been holding me up and who would we be without our communities. I'm going to end by quoting writer and Asian trans woman Kai Cheng and she says, our stories of truth are not weapons. Rather, truth and the pain it sometimes causes are instruments of healing. And just as bones that have broken and reconnected in the wrong way must be rebroken in order to heal once more, I believe we must use the truth of our painful stories to break open the silence in communities around sex, rape, trauma, and desire in order to find a greater, more connected way of being. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, I just want to give a quick note before Dr. Rowe comes up. I just want to mention that it is 12.54 right now, and um, we'll be running the discussion question and answers period after the panel, and people are free to leave earlier if they need to go to class. Thank you. I'm going to be really, I'm going to try to be very quick. Um, first, I'd just like to thank Stephanie for organizing this, this panel and um, for inviting me to share a few resources with you all today. Um, and thanks, big thank you to Nora, JP, and Kay for creating the foundation for the discussions that will really follow, not just within this room, but I'm sure will precede us as we move out into the world today. Um, to provide you with just a few resources, um, I wanted to mention that if you know of anybody who's in immediate danger, to, to please call 911. Um, they're really our first point of contact in, in an emergency. And maybe I could leave this next one up um, for the duration of the time together. Um, these are a list of, of really for, first point of contact resources, both on and off campus. Um, the first being the AMS Sexual Assault Support Center who provides information advocacy and supports with, re with reporting and connecting to services, as well as counseling services, which provides one-on-one -on -one counseling support on campus. Um, we also have the Student Health Center, which can provide medical care. However, if you know of somebody who has experienced um, an assault within, I think it's 72 hours, they can go to the um, Vancouver General Hospital. There's sexual assault services where a forensic exam can be collected. Um, this team also has access to STI treatment and pregnancy prevention, as well as the for forensic exams. Um, there are a number of other pieces that I'm going to leave up on the screen, but the one I wanted to note is that Victims Link, which is a 24-7 phone line that anyone can call. They offer supports and links to communities um, with about 130 languages, including 17 North American Aboriginal languages. They also have TTY accessible and interpretation services, which are available for folks in all major languages. Um, all of this information is available on students.ubc.ca slash sexual dash assault. Um, so please feel free to, to write that down and take that with you. Um, on that link, you'll also find a list of resources around um, different reporting options, depending on an individual's needs or wants. But in this moment, I'll leave this here and um, hand it back to Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to the panelists. Now, um, I'd like to ask people if you've written down any questions on your cue cards to pass them along down the row and Sue will come by and collect them. We're also opening the floor now to questions from the audience. 
Yeah, Laura. <laughs> Uh, I'm not actually sure. I have a lot of things to say in relation to this, in part because um, I find that I'm still uh, trying to find my footing uh, in Vancouver um, in these uh, Coast Salish territories, uh, having just moved back here a couple of years ago um, from Toronto. So I'm still in the process of learning and rerouting myself. Um, I do want to name and acknowledge um, some of the particularly like uh, Filipino Canadian um, communities that are doing some of this work in terms of connecting um, Filipino Canadian uh, communities in particular with indigenous uh, struggles in relation particularly to land and resource extraction, uh, also in relation to, um, to sexual and gender violence. Um, and some of this work is happening in, uh, on kitchen tables, in um, informal um, gatherings as opposed to formal organizations. Uh, so I've been lucky enough to be part of um, a series of community conversations uh, relating to this uh, with um, folks who are in this room or were in this room, right? So uh, Saul, uh, Diana over here, along with uh, Mae Farales, uh, Leah, Mel, Matining, and others have been kind of organizing particularly around uh, linking Filipino-Canadian communities and are thinking about our place uh, on this land. Uh, with indigenous struggles for sovereignty uh, and land, um, particularly in the context of uh, Unistoten, um, of First Nations in the northern uh, part of BC. So, um, and I say these are informal um, kind of things happening because we literally like call the community, or they, I should say, call the community and say, we're gonna have a potluck dinner at this location at this date, these are some of the things we're gonna be talking about. We'll sit at a table, share stories, um, and think together about what it means uh, to be um, settlers, racialized settlers uh, on this land. Uh, and some of that conversation has included um, questions of gender and sexuality. So that is one example I can give. Um, that's a really, is this even? Okay. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, I, in terms of uh, what I know for Chinese communities, um, I, I want to name um, folks that are doing this work, uh, Rita Wong and Dorothy Christian. Rita Wong is a prof at, I think, Emily Carr, and she writes a lot about um, Asian, Canadian, and Indigenous relationships, specifically organizing around water and how we can think through water as a, as a it's how like we are made up, our bodies are made up of water, we live near water, and how that can be a means of connecting social justice movements. Um, and she works with Dorothy Christian, who's um, Chinese and Canadian and indigenous from the Swetmik uh, Okanagan Nation, um, to do that kind of like collaborative community dialogue. Um, also Janie Liu, who's a prof here um, at UBC. Last term I was really lucky to be in a First Asian Studies course called Asian Canadian an indigenous critical like relationship or like community something, and it was fantastic. Um, and I learned a lot about not only my own um, history but also how to be in responsible allyship to the folks of this land. Um, and I also know outside of academic context that, like JP was saying, a lot of these things are happening around kitchen tables. Um, I want more potlucks. Like when I hear you talk about having Filipino Canadian potlucks to talk about ancestry and gender and sexuality. I want that for my communities, so let's talk about that. Um, I know that, like, my, like for example, my friend Jane makes a lot of dumplings, and like, I don't know how to make dumplings, and I would love to learn how to make dumplings and also talk about relationships to land by way of dumplings, <laughs> you know? But like, those are things that we need because I think within our com communities as racialized peoples, we need that healing, we need that connection to food, to land, to language, um, and then also to talk about responsibility in the same vein. Um, and uh, that's all I'll say for now. Also, 
to plug. I, Asian Youth Dialogues is having a lot of really important conversations around that. Um, there's a, a dance party for queer, trans, indigenous people of color that's happening on Saturday, and it's organized to do that kind of like dancing and celebration, but also to think more about um, communities of color on indigenous land. Um, yeah. that you provided an ASL interpreter, so I want to thank you for that. Um, a lot of times, you know, people, there aren't resources to provide interpretation or access for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, so I just wanted to say thank you for making this event accessible. <coughs> you know, as a, a cultural group, deaf people don't have a like a specific location kind of to call our own, you know, as other cultural groups do. And I think in the same way um, that the queer community doesn't necessarily have, you know, is it location based. But I notice a lot of queer events are becoming more accessible to deaf people and other ones are as well. But I think it can be challenging because Because um, in the deaf community, we don't really focus on kind of race or ethnicity. We focus on our identity as, you know, deaf or hard of hearing. And how that affects our lives. So. I just wanted to, you know, put that out there and also say thank you. Thank you. trying to think I've, I've been here um, about 10 years and I know that the the gap has been coming here in different iterations for I want to say 13 14 years so there is quite a long and and contentious history with its presence and I know at one point it was it was fairly organized um, and there was an opportunity to have the display which was much larger at one point and then a counter display of sort um, so that it almost created a, a hallway for people to choose to walk through or not. Now my understanding is it's much more ad hoc and people come with posters that they walk around with. Um, is that still the case this year? I missed them this year. Yeah? And did they have the, the standing? Yeah. Oh, I can't brought that back again. Um, I think there's actually, there hasn't been much written about it, and I, and I really think that there should, because there is, there is quite, a, quite a history. Um, I would almost look at some of the policies, I'm not really, it's not a policy. Um, some of the ways in which the University of Toronto has gone about working with the particular student group, because it's a student group who brings an outside organization in to host this piece. Um, 
and they do it on university lands. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking this through as I talk because I don't have a clear answer. I mean, the answer is the student club does have the right to bring them here. We don't have anything that talks about the lack of um, materials being displayed. If it really falls into, sadly, and this is just my understanding, um, into Canada's freedom of expression category. Um, and there hasn't been any Canadian attempts to engage in a, in a lawsuit, really, to see what might, what constitutes hate speech um, within those visual images. So there's a lot that's, that's still quite unknown. I know the University of Toronto has done some interesting things. Um, and it's, it's sitting in a really precarious gray zone, for lack of a better, better word. Um, so I have no real clear answer for you other than, to my understanding, it's really murky. Um, and I'm not quite sure where it's sitting. And there's lots of questions that want to respond to that. Yeah. Um, freedom of expression, um, is there not a way to exclude um, just the, even going for like the violent images or certain images in a public place? Is there not a way that you can approach from that perspective? Or? No, I don't think so. Um, partly because uh, the definition of um, disturbing or violent is very subjective um, and particularly queer organizations. Uh, queer history suggests that the discourse of disturbing can be used to police all manners of things and so that's another um, gray area that I'm not sure is going to work this way uh, in, in this case. Um, I do want to say that invoking freedom of speech is also a way um, to organize against uh, these things. Um, that as much as there is free freedom of speech does not mean that you can force people uh, to listen to you, right? That's one thing I wanna say. Second thing that I wanna say is that uh, just as you offer things on the table, uh, you should also be forced to reckon with people's reactions to it and some of that includes student protesting. Uh, and I say student protesting in part because some of my amazing students in my GRSJ 328 class um, after class literally went to that display with signs that, and uh, information uh, to talk to students who are passing by about how violent uh, and disturbing these uh, images are. And one, they got rid of the name, at least it's not on the display from last week, uh, Genocide Awareness Project. But one of my students, Clay Roth, um, wanted to really emphasize the fact that genocide is not a metaphor, right? It is not a freaking metaphor. That the use of that discourse um, on uh, unceded and occupied Musqueam territories is all manners of uh, settler colonial violence. So uh, I, I also want to name that actions are already happening, some of it ad hoc of students uh, organizing against it. So um, that too is an expression of freedom of speech. Um, I just want to say that um, in, within the sociology department, there's a couple of students and faculty members that are interested in holding a reading group over the summer or potentially further. And, um, if anyone's interested in have, like, continuing the conversation around um, um, body rights, birthing rights, and all these issues that are around what, um, I guess, what the genocide of the is project infringes on, then come talk to me, and I can tell you more about it too. Um, just putting that out there in case that uh, genocide awareness project is something that is uncomfortable to you and to you in the conversation. One of the things I'd like to put forward for those of you who are going to be back on campus next year is that they typically are on campus around International Women's Day. Um, and we don't necessarily know when they're going to show up. Um, but I know in the past, student, students have organized to be ready for that week and have been really on call to, to, to do just what JP's um, talked about, which is to, to respond and to counter protest. Um, and there's some really interesting things that have been done in Canada and the U.S. as counter-protest measures. Um, so if you're ever interested, 
I could probably send you some links. CJ, uh, I just wanted to comment on the rates, the incident rates of sexualized violence against Asian and Asian Canadians um, on campus and whether or not the university keeps those stats and whatever record keeping is actually a trap. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a really great question. At the moment, no Canadian institution that I'm aware of has really good climate assessment tools. Um, and I say climate assessment because that's typically the, the kind of mechanisms that universities used in order to gather that data. Um, there have been a few mechanisms tested at a few universities that we're looking at adopting. So while we don't have current numbers, um, we suspect that the incidences of sexual assault that are happening on campus mirror the incidences that are happening in broader Canadian society because we are not by any means operating within a vacuum. Um, we're a part of a North American fabric that allows sexual assault, sexualized violence to continue to happen. Um, realistically, I'm thinking we'll prob we're probably about two to three years out from having the first round of, of accurate statistics, which we'll, we will then grow upon um, over the coming years. Okay, so please, if there's no more questions, then please join me in thanking JP, Kay, and CJ for coming here today and giving wonderful presentations and being so open to share your thoughts with us. Thank you so much. And um, on behalf of ACAM, I'd like to give you some thank you gifts as, to for your appreciation. You just said we're all letter names. I know, I love that. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I'd also like to um, thank Sue for helping get with the cue cards, Jane and Maris for volunteering to be active listeners, and our ASL interpreter, Carly Stanbo, for her hard work in, in ensuring this event is accessible to more folks. Thanks as well to the ACAM staff, Sue, Cynthia, Denise, and Chris Lee, for offering great feedback and support leading up to this event. So this concludes our panel. Please sign up on our mailing list for future news and events. And don't forget that, forget that today's the deadline for the ACAM Student Journal. So if you have creative work or academic work you want to submit, please do it soon today. And yeah, thank you all for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.